I want to introduce Aziz. Uh, Aziz Azimi, uh, as I said, the uh, founding CEO of Technologist Inc., has uh, created a, a very successful company in Afghanistan. Uh, he goes way back with AACC. Long time ago, I convinced him to join the board of directors, or we convinced him to join the board of directors of AACC. And, and uh, we were talking about Afghanistan in 2003, late 2003, where we were forming this Chamber of Commerce. I was over in Kabul most of the time as senior advisor to this uh, emerging Chamber of Commerce and um, talked to Aziz. He's, and Aziz said, I don't know about going back to Afghanistan. You know, there's so many issues, so many problems. I said, well, go back and we'll get you to be the uh, director, uh, the executive director, I think, or the key guy for us, for this uh, new chamber, and you know, help us run this USAID program. So Aziz goes over there and talks to a number of our Afghan colleagues who are active in formulating the new chamber. It was called the Afghan International Chamber of Commerce, which eventually morphed with the government ACCI into the present day ACCI. Atikula sitting there knows this history well because he was with it from the get-go. Um, so Aziz goes over to Kabul and he meets with some of our colleagues and, and he also meets with one great man at USAID, Bob Wilson. And uh, he was deputy mission director at the time and uh, Aziz comes back and he's in business. He's starting up a new company called Technologists Inc. No, that wasn't a new company. It was, it was a Washington company. It was doing energy, a lot of energy and uh, related energy business here in the, the US. And uh, he said, I'm going to Kabul and we're going to build this company. And the rest is history. Uh, Technologists Inc. has done a million, uh, over $100 million in projects. And so he is our moderator today. He's going to give us some remarks about how he sees the future of the industry in Afghanistan and then introduce our panel. Um, our panel also uh, is uh, a great panel. Of course, you know Naeem Yassin from ABA, Rafat Ludin and his, his major effort along with Appleton and AECOM to build a big chunk of Kabul, New City, uh, uh, as the dust settles, that will happen. And at the end is Dave Van Horn, who is uh, currently working in Afghanistan. Uh, and some of you may know him as the former country director for ECCI. And I won't say anything more about that. But uh, Aziz, why don't you take it away? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Don, thank you very much for a wonderful uh, introduction. A um, couple of things I just want, I think we are, Don and I, we are both getting old and um, we forget a few things. Um, one of them was actually Don and I, we, we were the one that actually put together a proposal that created ACCI. Yeah. If you remember that, some, uh, we spent some uh, midnight oil on that. So. That's how I ended up going to Kabul, and he's correct. Um, as far as technologists is concerned, um, we have been in Afghanistan for the last 10 years. We have um, completed over 80 projects. Probably we have built more projects than anybody else. At least that's what I'm hoping. And we have, uh, we have done projects from uh, $15,000 to $100 million. Uh, we have worked pretty much across Afghanistan. And I'm very proud to say that um, last time I checked, uh, we had as many as 2,650 people we employed. And at least 650 of them were engineers and surveyors. So I'm very proud of some of those statistics rather than how many projects we have completed. And uh, we have always uh, pushed quality. Enough about technologists. Uh, today we're gonna uh, talk about um, 
probably one of a few successful stories of industries in Afghanistan. We're going to talk about construction industry. And I might know a little bit about it, and especially that the fact that I have worked with the U.S. government since 1979 in a variety of uh, uh, ways, but always as a consultant. So I know about the budgeting, how it works, and what, what has happened. And at the same time, we have an, a, a phenomenally excellent um, panel for you who's going to put in and add more to what I will be talking. I'm not going to take too much time, uh, your time, and basically I have only about five slides to talk about. The first one is the state of construction industry in Afghanistan. May I have the next slide, please? It, what was before 9-11 and what happened after 9-11? There are no reliable statistics before 9-11. And I guess during Taliban and during war, there was no industry to speak of. I can't say there was none whatsoever, but there was none in, 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 in any form that statistically could be significant. After 9-11, um, the last number that I checked from ISA, there were um, 6,540 construction companies. Um, a lot of people, they may argue that a lot of these companies are basically, they are just uh, uh, paper tigers or they're just shells. But I would say the number is much higher. The reason for that is if you take a look at um, how different cities in Afghanistan have grown, just let's take Kabul, for example. Um, I left Afghanistan in 1970, and Kabul was so small you couldn't even believe it. I went back to Afghanistan in, in 2003, and it wasn't as, as, you know, as big as when I left Kabul, which was about 35 years later. But today, Kabul, if you look at Kabul, it goes from Pahman all the way to Polacharhi. And, and as you look at it, it's, it's walls after walls. You do not find a single space. Somebody must have built that. Somebody built those walls. Somebody built those, those houses. So construction industry in Afghanistan has been phenomenal success. I mean, I can always argue that as an American, I'm an Afghan American, as an American, America have been extraordinarily successful. And and their engagement in Afghanistan. Even I would go, if, I, if I'm not making a mistake, I think we have been more successful than we were in Germany, in Japan after World War II. It depends where we have started. For those of you who remember 2003, there was not even a phone call. You couldn't even make a call to, to the US. Right now you got Skype, you got uh, four or five uh, uh, cell phones, you know, companies, all kinds of things. So as far as industry, construction industry is concerned, it is one of a few successful industries. I think I'll put it probably, if not ahead of telephone, banking, media, it's that big. It's not only you look at Kabul, just go 50 miles away from Kabul. If you go north towards uh, Charakar or Parwan, or you go towards uh, Wardak, which is one of really hot spots of Taliban, and you will see their khalas after khalas after khalas, and they were all built in the last seven, eight years. So somebody built it. They may not have been registered in ISA, but there were people who were building it. So they must be part of the construction industry. And I've said that. Next slide, please. A Couple of things has happened to um, construction industry. One of the things you will see is as the number of projects increased, the quality suffered. It's an it's, it's, it's a issue of supply and demand. We didn't have enough engineers. We didn't have enough foremen. Remember, we, in, 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 uh, I, I think there are very few people who are in my age that left Afghanistan. We had these things. We call it in America, foremen in Afghanistan. We call it Boshi. There are not that many Boshis. Boshis are very, very important. They are more important than engineers because they know how to take a two-dimensional uh, plan and actually make it into three-dimensional. And you will find out in a lot of construction 
uh, structures in Afghanistan, that there was no Bashi, was only an engineer, everything is wrong. I can go back and just take a, uh, a marker and go mark all over the place because there was no Bashi involved. So the quality did suffer. But the, perhaps the biggest reason for quality in Afghanistan was this issue of subcontracting. Where a prime contractor won a project and starts selling it, it was sold as many as five to six subcontractors. Everybody got a piece of it. But yet, when it came to actual structure, whatever it was, whether it was a bridge or a school or a clinic, there was not enough money left to build anything worthwhile. So I put that one in one of the major issues of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, how various uh, institutions that could be uh, the US government uh, projects. It was um, um, what I call multinational or, or uh, multilateral uh, institutions, such as World Bank, ADB. They took easy way out. So that could be one of the things that did suffer was that quality. May I have the next one, please? One of the things that you, uh, Colonel mentioned something about how much um, work he put in, but there was so much other work put in in the construction industry. And the construction industry in Afghanistan, in the large part, owes its basically um, success in the funding of the US, uh, US government. And that was whether it was for the Army, whether it was UID, USAID for clinics and everything else, and that they actually pushed a lot of money. They created a lot of engineers. Um, good engineers was, was, was developed during this, this, this time. Uh, and, and at the same time, um, as industry picked up, there were other things that has happened to it, and that was the reduction. I wrote actually, the, uh, the word, the current crisis of the industry. One of the things that you see as the level of, of um, funding start winding down, the impact on that was huge. And, and it, came, it turns out that a lot of these companies that we talk about, it was reduced. There are only few companies left in Afghanistan that they can do actually credible job. I'm talking about large jobs, because right now, we are talking about infrastructure in Afghanistan. We are not talking about a building. We are talking about 100 kilometer road, you know? 100 kilometers, we are talking about dams, we are talking about power plants. And I, with all due respect for my, all my colleagues who are in the construction business, I don't see that kind of oomph, that kind of power that goes out there and says, I'm gonna build a 100 megawatt power plant. It's not there. So it's, it's, a, it's a much smaller thing. Can I see the second one, please? The next. Okay. Here's the present problems that I see. Some of them are actually structural. For example, the tax laws. There is a tax law being proposed, which is a value-added tax. You might ask, what's wrong with value-added tax? There is nothing wrong with value-added tax. People actually, actually, Ministry of Finance in Afghanistan touts that the first one went out in, in 1916 or 1918 in Germany or someplace in Europe, and everybody else picked it up. That is correct, but the only other problem with it is that a lot of energy, instead of being spent somewhere else, it is being spent in actually paperwork. And the structure today, the construction companies, they don't have that much capacity to spend all the time chasing this. There's a, a lot easier ways. A lot of new, a lot of countries in the world, they look for a one-time tax. It doesn't really matter. I think companies in Afghanistan, they're willing to pay higher tax upfront, but not to keep everything else going. 
because the, the, the way the construction is, is working, that you go down the street and you pick up a nail or something else, you can't keep track of all the paperwork. And also spawns a very bad thing, it, 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 which is bureaucracy, and with bureaucracy comes uh, other issues, negative issues. Okay, and the, the, the second one is basic, if you look at it, is the, the way the funding is taking place both at the USG level and as well as uh, the multi, uh, 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 multilateral institutions, such as World Bank and ADB. Somewhere around 2009 to 2000, uh, uh, 2009, this entire thing, the, what, what I call the first world, uh, the first world um, procurement uh, system was applied. What that means is was like uh, they, uh, they were, uh, they were, companies were asked for bonds, bid bonds, and, and basically performance bonds. There is nothing wrong with that, by the way. But there is a lot wrong about that. First of all, a lot of good companies that they are small, they were kicked out. So they went to second and third tier immediately. Is that just the policy that uh, Colonel mentioned that we are leaving? And it was not true. It may, we, we may not leave at all, but it just left that impression. And, and the result of that was very interesting because actually I have many projects that, that I can give you. A good pro uh, example of it is there's a project up north, which is a, a ring road, a part of ring road up north, northwest of Afghanistan. It was awarded to a large company because they met all the, uh, all the procurement uh, requirements. But guess what? They never made it because nobody asked them, could they do the job? There's a huge number of that. So who's actually uh, basically um, profiting from this or benefiting from this? is the larger companies. So the smaller companies, that they're sitting on the sideline. And that's one of the biggest problems that uh, uh, institutions such as uh, USAID, US Army Corps of Engineers, World Bank, ADB, they got to take a look at their procurement process one more time. One more time, please. Um, we, we did talk about the bureaucratic institution. Then other thing is, let's look at the institutions that are uh, institutional weaknesses. Banking in Afghanistan, okay? The policies, especially after what I call the uh, Kabul Bank Syndrome, it's very difficult to get loan, and the loans it gyrates from 10% to 18%. So if you're paying 10 to 18%, um, interest, how can you be um, competitive? And at the same time, I do know this much that Exim Bank in America, you know, they can help a lot of American companies to get as much as like 2 to 3% interest rate. Now, if you are at 18% interest rate, you're 15% behind eight ball. So, those are fundamental things that are incredibly wrong with what, what is happening. It needs to be, they are structural. The new government in Afghanistan, the funders, they got to take a look at some of these structural problems that Afghan uh, construction companies, uh, 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 they the actually uh, see today. Okay, my last, um, my last slide, please. Okay. I said plenty about this construction industry, but now where do we go from here? I will give you a couple of things. Right now, a lot of small, such as housings and stuffs, are pretty much finished. Now we got to go into to infrastructure, pipelines, transmission lines, you know, uh, roads. Uh, I mean, I, I heard there, there's a hundred and some kilometers going between Dushi and and Shebar, there's a, a north-south road, uh, there is a, a ring road. Uh, 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 I just heard someone talked about uh, uh, 
railroad, uh, there's a pipeline, there's a transmission line, okay? But I, we got to help the um, construction industry in Afghanistan to be able to do those things. One thing that, that is important, I just 10 days ago when I, I went to Turkey, then I went to Kazakhstan and I just sat with Turkish company, I realized a couple of things. The Turkish companies, they had incredible um, relationship with their bank, uh, with their whole banking institutions. Like bid bond, for them is a ladder. For any of you who wants to put a bid bond, you have to put like, if it's a $200,000, you have to actually write a check for $200,000. So you are $200,000, if it's a performance bond, now you are millions of dollars out. And once you give when the project, guess what happens? You don't have enough money to run it. So those are fundamental questions that need to be asked. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's pretty much what I had, but this is how we're gonna do um, today's panels. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna have um, the panel uh, participants to come over and, uh, and, and, and uh, give you, um, I'm sure, the most eloquent uh, presentation. And what we'll do is any question that you will have, uh, there was a gentleman sitting here, can you write it down on a piece of paper and give it to him? At the end of each presentation, we will take questions. At the end of the entire panel? At the end of the entire panel. Okay, that's about it. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, okay the next person coming up is, is gonna be Mr. Van Horn. And uh, he's going to talk to you about uh, various things. Okay, please. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Azizi, for your very perceptive remarks to open our panel. Good morning again to all of you. Some of you may remember me from my participation on this panel last year. Let me start by thanking. Mr. Lutfi, and especially the Honorable Dr. Ritter for an invitation to come back this year. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I've got uh, a limited amount of time, so I'll only try to make a few, few points. Hopefully, while they will be issues that you've heard many speakers refer to, the perspective I offer will add a little bit of value. Uh, but first, some correction, some addition. Uh, I was formerly the country manager for ECCI. Many of you know that company. However, I was not on the construction side. I was hired to manage the $750 million energy and water contract with USAID. And some of you know that that contract turned out to be hollow, and the hollowness of the contract will be one of the points that I hope to leave with you this morning. To wit, my team won one contract for $43 million under that indefinite quantity, indefinite delivery prime contract. So I was also the uh, Black & Veatch senior manager for the Berger Black & Veatch Afghanistan Infrastructure Rehabilitation Program, which was USAID's largest infrastructure contract in Afghanistan. We passed uh, uh, a little over $1 billion uh, before we were done with that. And it included the 105 megawatt power plant that Mr. Azizi referred to. Uh, also, uh, over 20 years ago, I was the planning director for Dubai when we did their multi-billion dollar uh, infrastructure plan. So hopefully that gives you uh, uh, a couple of reference points for my background. Next slide, please. Just a few points from each of these, you know, my perceptions, my comments, mine alone, some things about where we are currently, um, a little bit on the contracting environment. I think I want to, to leave you with some points about monitoring and evaluation, which will become even more important. Uh, some remarks on pluses and minuses. 
going to focus on two donors quickly and briefly, two you're probably well familiar with, and then two of the major trust funds, AITF, ARTF. Uh, I won't address the, uh, the Law and Order Trust Fund. Uh, and then what is, to me, the, the greatest news, uh, other than uh, everybody getting along at the London Conference last week, the signing of the agreements between the four countries, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, for the CASA 1000 project, which I think is a very positive and hopeful note for all peoples of Central Asia, and particularly for the contracting community in Afghanistan. And then a couple of conclusions. Next slide, please. Okay, you've all heard, well, you know, the money is drying up. It's not drying up. It is going to decline. Uh, for example, um, DOD is not requesting additional funds for the Afghan Infrastructure Fund for fiscal year 2015. That will probably never happen again, but who knows? Um, the effects of the reduction in foreign aid is of concern to everyone. Concerns Afghans, rightfully so. And the international community has a stake in this as well. What does that mean? Well, at the London conference last week, the major donors reconfirmed their commitment to the pledges made at the Tokyo conference when the mutual accountability framework was signed. But the donor countries remain very concerned given the security issues, the lack of resources that they're able to call upon now or were able to call upon when the coalition had tremendous assets on the military side to support the reconstruction effort. So that'll bring me back to monitoring and evaluation. Next slide, please. On the contracting environment, what I am hearing is that donor relationships with the new government are cautiously optimistic. They're hopeful. But as we have heard, while the two principals involved with the new administration are, by most everybody's judgment, um, honorable and well-intentioned, the execution of the administration's policies and programs remains a question mark at this point. Let us all be hopeful that the new administration, starting with the ministers and the deputy ministers, will be just as positive a note as the election results and the new unity government. All right. Security conditions remain a concern. We've all seen the news. I've heard from friends. Uh, one of the recent attacks was right next door to, to a good friend of mine. You know, and, and Western expat staff are leaving. So some of the capability some of the capacity building expertise, which is still needed, may be more reluctant to come to Afghanistan in the future or to remain there now. Let's hope that's not the case. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, you know, the DOD funding is changing, and that's where the largest drop off is going to occur. Perhaps more importantly for the money that's remaining, the donors have been shifting that. You're all aware of the, uh, the on-budget initiative. You know, it is tied to accountability, or supposedly tied to accountability. So what has happened? The uh, multi-donor trust funds have benefited. Uh, you know, many donors, including USAID, are, are moving their funding from direct to contracts through 
either the ADB or the World Bank Trust Funds. And there's more funding direct to the Afghan line ministries and to the state-owned enterprises such as DABs. Next slide, please. On monitoring, uh, one of my friends uh, is a geospatial intelligence specialist. His firm was brought in by the Brits uh, to work on the counter-narcotics program. One of the things that they have developed is a tremendous remote sensing capability. I think that innovative use of such data as that remote sensing database may be a key for Afghans to become more engaged with effective monitoring and evaluation activities. Look around you. How can you help the donors with their requirements for transparency and accountability? Is there something that you or a friend of yours can contribute that will allow the donors to meet their requirements for accountability? Please consider it carefully because it will need to be done. Um, We know a lot of money has been spent over the past dozen or so years. Much of the result has been successful. There have been notable projects not so successful. Some would argue that 105 megawatt power plant is one of those not successful. I would argue on the contrary because when the Sherbagon gas fields come online, as they will, one of the byproducts will be heavy fuel oil. And that plant is designed to run off of heavy fuel oil and Kabul will be able to use that 105 megawatt power plant with hydrocarbons from Afghanistan. Think about it. I think that's a good thing. But as the donors turn to more consideration consideration perhaps they should have given up front to sustainment, to operations and maintenance. You know, where is that money going to come from? You have something called donor fatigue. Well, you know, budgets are set. Prime Minister Cameron, Secretary Kerry, other nations, donor nations, made their commitments, renewed their pledges last week. They'll do it again in June next year. Let's hope. You know, so there's going to be the requirement to account for those funds, and they may choose to move them to operations and maintenance, to sustainment capabilities. So for those of you who have logistics companies, think about what that might mean for you. For those of you who have construction companies, Think about what you can provide in terms of maintaining all of these facilities which have been delivered in the past dozen years or so. Next slide, please. This is, this is my perspective. I think that the recognition government personnel had been challenged to deliver all of the acquisition and procurement tasks that they were given is well known. Well, now that the money's dropping off, it's my hope that the talented and capable acquisition specialist will be able to better manage the contracting process for all of us. We probably, many of us, experience delays simply due to the enormous amount of work I know I have with USAID. So let's hope that that situation improves. Another point on that, uh, as things change, consider, you know, don't need more gym equipment. I just put a gym in my garage. Uh, bad weather's coming and I can't go outside and walk. There's a lot of gyms in Afghanistan, but I couldn't pay to ship them here. 
You don't need to order gems anymore, but there will be things that are needed. So consider what is going to be needed. Adapt your businesses to those things that will be required as Afghanistan moves forward from where it is now. Next slide, please. Okay, I need to spend uh, uh, a little bit of time, but uh, uh, in order to speed this up, uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, USAID except to ask to go to the next slide because it says aid priorities. And this is readily available on the website. It's, it's their forecast. Be aware of what the donors are forecasting so you can position yourself to go after work for which you're qualified. Next slide, please. The same with DFID and the other donors. This is their priorities. These are all available. Okay, go next to uh, ARTF, uh, the Asian Development Bank, and AITF, the World Bank, pay close attention to their forecast. Position yourself so that you will be meeting, ready to meet, ready to propose on those projects. If you don't know them, if you don't know, uh, Richard Spencer used to be at the World Bank, you know, talk to him. Talk to the others. Find out what they're thinking of, what the demands will be. All right. If you would, please, go to CASA 1000 slide. Two down, I think. Next slide, next slide. It doesn't matter. The Central Asia, South Asia, electricity, transmission, and trade Project, CASA 1000. Okay. There's going to be a lot of need for construction to complete the transmission and distribution system for this. Those of you who know how to do this should be happy about the prospect. Those of you who don't know the power sector but are interested, look to team up with people who do, but be sure you bring them something something of value to offer. This is going to be very competitive. N last slide, please. Okay, in conclusion, as Mr. Azizi alluded to, there's going to be a shakeout. There's going to be continuing competition and it's going to be more fierce. Position yourself, know your market, know your market. You know, I have been retained by three Afghan firms just to work with them. They call me, say, David, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Do you think we, we have the right stuff to go after this project? Or who can we talk to to team up with? Find some mentors. There are many Western firms who've been there. Maybe, maybe they don't want to have their people there, or maybe they want to work with an Afghan firm because more of the money is going to go directly to the Afghan government. Think about it. Position yourself. Okay. Thank you very much. The next presenter is uh, Mr. Yassin. He's the president of ABA. Um, I've known him personally for a number of years. But he's a very important, him and his association is very important for the future of construction industry. Because he has to become the voice of all the construction companies in a single source. And that's what makes you and him very powerful partner in any future projects or any, in any discussions with donors, Afghan government, of uh, multinational institutions. So please welcome Mr. Yassin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Azimi. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, respected guests, good morning. My name is Naim Yassin, 
President of Afghanistan Builder Association, as you know, is ABA. Afghanistan Builder Association is the largest growing association in Afghanistan. And also, we have uh, seven elected board of members. And uh, we have a branch office in East Zone in Jalalabad and also in Kandahar. Next, please. ABA currently have around more than 500 members of construction company, construction material, and construction heavy machinery, and recently also construction material testing laboratory company in, in the field of construction, road building, dam, etc. ABA, they have a monthly meeting with our members, if they have any problem with discussion about the future plan, about the training, about the capacity building, and also for the coming, upcoming event, we discuss if they have any problem with the government, with the, with the, between the members, we discuss and solve the problem. We have uh, following services for the uh, finding expedient and partner for local and international organization in the following field. Road, bridges, uh, mine, energy and power, airport construction, railroad. Let's see Next, please. Okay, AB provides also a legal uh, consultancy for local and international company. If they have any dispute, if any problem, we can help them and for the legal ways. Every year we have a delegation to send to overseas, to India, Turkey, China, uh, Dubai, in this country, especially every year, we come to Washington for matchmaking conference. We travel, we send our delegation to those countries. AB for <coughs> providing job career service in the following field, engineer, technical consultant, legal consultant, scale and non-scale labor, capacity development. We do all these for international company or local company. We have a capacity building program with the cooperation of US Army for the capacity building for training, CQM, safety, scheduling. We have a, every month or every two months we have a, this training in our office in ABA. And uh, recently we signed agreement with the US Army Corp of Engineer from now on, ABA will rise for lab certification. From now on, ABA certify all the lab company in Afghanistan through ABA. And uh, recently, we signed this agreement in uh, Intercontinental Hotel. And also, we have a very short uh, video for this uh, ceremony. Do you have a voice or? Thank you, Renato. It's great to be part of this, uh, this history. Afghanistan that with the remaining value of $700 million, and that will complete, uh, that will extend until December of 2017. <laughs> ما تمام کمپانی لب سرتیکیشن که در افغانستان هستند و از طریق تادی شرکت های ساختمانی اونا چی میشن؟ سرتفای میشن. 
دمی پریزنتیشن خود کماندار یوس آرمی کورپس از دیه و سیونتین هندر میلین دالر هفه پروژیکت فور انتل 2017 means now they have a, enough money for those project is not completed or those project will be the new project for the Afghanistan. Uh, every year we have a delegation to send overseas. This year uh, we have a, send a delegation to money for 2015 in Turkey, India, China, and USAID, USAID. And this, this, you saw the logo, these are our partner with ABA. Next, please. Uh, this is uh, our main office in Kabul, and uh, this all is our contact information, our website, our uh, email, all this information. You can get it if you need any, some more information, we have a booth next we can give you more information. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll be happy to work with you. Thank you. Thank on you, time. Yeah. Perfect time. Yeah, on time. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the next presenter is uh, Mr. Ludin. He's the president of uh, International Home uh, Finance and Development, uh, LLC. Um, he has a, um, a, an interesting project that you all want to know. Um, he is involved with a number of other companies in, develop, in developing the new Kabul City Initiative, right? And um, he will tell you all about his project, and I'm sure you're eager to hear him. All right, sir? Thank you. Mr. Lodi. Thank you, sir. Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, please allow me to start with the uh, universal a uh, greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the name of God, most gracious, uh, most merciful, peace be upon him. This is an animation of our project, the Kabul New City Project, that we'd like to share with you. This is how we visualize part of the Kabul New City to look like. Existing Kabul right now, as you um, as you see it, which houses about six million people. Those are the main roads linking Kabul, and this is where the Kabul new city will be built, about one and a half times the size of existing Kabul. And this will be phase one of Kabul new city, and this is the area of parcel one, which is our project, about 838 hectares altogether. the main roads leading into um, that development. As you can see, there will be a light rail connection, which goes all the way to, um, to Kabul proper. The yellow, yellow areas are the residential districts, and then we will go into one of those residential districts that will be built like a module. Each module will have about 250 to 300, 400 housing units, plus other infrastructure components. There will be a main road leading through the development. And this will give you a feel for how that uh, module will look like. And then we take a look at some of the housing models that we will be um, building. This is a Qala concept. You can see four houses within one boundary, which is very traditional in Afghanistan. Each, you know, four brothers, for example, could res reside in there. They have their own personal space, and then they have a common space in between for functions and other stuff. These are duplexes, you know, could be uh, rented by two family members, and they could choose to uh, remove the wall or keep the wall in between.
Just a little bit of an uh, overview about um, IHFD itself. We uh, were created and uh, established in 2007. Even before that, in 2006, the concept of, the, uh, of this project was developed. Um, and um, and in, in, in 2007, we, uh, uh, we, started to, um, uh, we started our operations in Afghanistan, which included, uh, among others, also um, uh, activities in, uh, in real estate uh, development and, and uh, uh, renewable energy, such as wind power, solar power, hydropower. We have a manufacturing facility in Kabul where we manufacture quite a number of these uh, uh, systems and uh, and we started also in environmental technologies which include solar uh, sorry uh, solid waste management systems and wastewater treatment systems um, and we have implemented a number of those projects in Afghanistan today um, IHFD has operations in Afghanistan in uh, in Libya um, we have in UAE and we are starting operations in uh, in Turkey fairly soon um, now some of the projects that are really very close to my heart, in addition to the Kabul New City project, um, is uh, the development and manufacture of the solar irrigation system, a mobile solar irrigation system, uh, which was developed, designed, and manufactured in Afghanistan, which we are promoting right now. Uh, the uh, solar uh, fruit drying system, uh, which was also developed in Afghanistan, manufactured there. Um, and, uh, and now we are propagating. We went through the, um, the first season of testing on that this year. We um, manufacture, uh, design, develop, manufacture also um, solar hot water systems. Um, and of course, the bioshaft system, which is a sludgeless, odorless, uh, very small footprint wastewater treatment plant, which could be ideal in, uh, in the context uh, in Afghanistan as well as in, uh, in other countries. So Kabul New City, uh, a lot of you are familiar uh, with that project. Um, it is a uh, new city about 12 uh, miles uh, northeast of the downtown Kabul in the Desabs district. Uh, it will accommodate more than 3 million um, uh, units. A total uh, budget of about um, $80 billion, um, and uh, it will become the commercial hub of uh, Kabul New City. The promoter is the Desabs City Development Authority. And then specifically to our project, we will build about 13,000 housing units that will accommodate about 70,000 people, and we will um, have more than 3.3 million square meters of commercial space. For those who are familiar with foot, that's about 33 million square feet. Um, out of the 838 hectare uh, land that will be used, saying about 450 hectares will be um, revenue generating. We have already secured about 250 uh, hectares of that. Can we move to the next slide, please? So this is an overview of uh, where it is uh, located. If you look at the two bottom um, uh, slides, those are the, um, uh, the structure plans for uh, parcel one. Can we go to the next slide, please? So um, as I said, about 250 um, hectares of the land has already been acquired. JICA is supporting with about the project with a grant of about $77 million. And, um, and ADB with about $20 million for uh, primary infrastructure. And, um, and we have developed a, de put together a very interesting team of uh, uh, project managers uh, that include AECOM, a Fortune 500 company, uh, as well as ACI, and ACI is sitting uh, there on that table, um, and ARG, uh, which is also a, um, uh, an African-American company. Uh, they will be running uh, the project overall. Uh, then we have a, um, a design team out of Colorado in the U.S., which is, uh, uh, they will carry out high-level designs, and then all the detailed designs will be carried out in Afghanistan. Um, and um, Civitas is, uh, is, is very famous, has built, designed uh, more than a dozen cities throughout the world. Um, so very, very strong, uh, strong design team out there because we want to build the best city that is, uh, that is out there not only in Afghanistan, but anywhere in the world. Uh, we also have a very strong finance team uh, that will be working with us. As far as the um, existing situation, the contract was signed uh, for development of the city in September of last year. Uh, we have, uh, in the meantime, six conceptual designs that have been approved by DCDA, that's the authority. Uh, we have raised the capital between 50 and $100 million for the project. Uh, we will uh, be mobilizing to the site next week. Actually, we're supposed to mobilize yesterday, but. Uh, DCD asked us to postpone it until next week uh, so that their management comes back from international trip. 
the design work is continuing, and um, we are basically waiting for um, our board's approval uh, to initiate uh, uh, construction activities, which is uh, pending uh, political risk insurance uh, provided by uh, a number of different sources, including OPEC, World Bank, and, uh, and some private reinsurers. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, so this is a, um, and I spoke to you about the modular system that we'll be using in our, in our designs. And this uh, modular system, um, so th those are the six different modules that have been uh, approved uh, by DCDA. You can see all those green spaces. There are a lot of green, sp green areas in, in each neighborhood and houses are built around those green spaces that will allow, allow families to grow together. It's the concept of the guzar in, in Afghanistan, uh, which, you know, creates cohesion within, within the community. Can we move to the next slide, please? So this is how then those, um, some of those um, uh, concepts and are implemented on the ground once you adjust it to topography. Can you move to the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Yes. Um, the next one, please. So the project is going to have fairly significant economic uh, benefits. Can you move to the next one, please? Um, among others, uh, we um, uh, will have uh, significant project activities happening on the construction side. So we'll be, um, on the design side, we'll be awarding uh, more than $20 million of, uh, of contracts, mostly to Afghan design firms, construction design firms. We will do uh, construction contracting worth in excess of $1.5 billion over the next uh, six years or so. Um, and uh, all of those companies that will be carrying out those designs, will, these construction activities will be Afghan companies. So your companies will qualify to do um, uh, that work. Um, and then um, construction material, uh, we are expecting uh, to purchase about $1.5 billion worth of construction material over the next six years in order to complete this project. And in order um, to do that, of course, we, we prefer to have that work, um, you know, the, the construction materials supplied from Afghanistan. So we encourage you to set up factories, work with us, uh, discuss with us, and then po possibly invest in setting up factories to manufacture those material in Afghanistan. Also on the logistics side, um, over $10 million and in supply of services, including training, et cetera, uh, more than $25 million. Every person who will be working in the project will be eligible to receive free training from a laborer to all the way top people um, uh, in there. So um, on the banking and mortgage, uh, we will be um, uh, investing more than $3 billion on, uh, on that uh, uh, side of the business. Um, and we'll be working uh, very closely with local Afghan banks in order to facilitate that. And we have also hired a uh, company here out of uh, the Washington DC area to help set up the mortgage program because every house will be offered with uh, with 20-year mortgage for, uh, for the buyers. Um, so the um, total direct uh, economic impact of the project will be in excess of $7.2 billion, and the indirect impact will be, um, uh, I'm sorry, and the indirect impact will be in excess of $72 billion uh, in, uh, in the Afghan economy. Uh, now that includes also an investment in, um, in uh, real, real estate, commercial, residential, as well as otherwise, um, by Afghans in Afghanistan as well as Afghans in diaspora. So say Afghans here in the US, if you want to buy houses in Afghanistan or commercial space, you'll be able to do so. And then as well as uh, supply of goods in excess of $50 million, marketing and sales in excess of $100 million over the life of the project. Um, so companies that are experts in, uh, in marketing, um, please contact us and, um, and we'll be very, very happy to discuss with you those innovative approaches that we'll be utilizing. Can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, in addition to that, the government uh, through DCDA will be investing um, uh, in excess of $500 million on social infrastructure, government facilities, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, with uh, indirect economic impact in excess of uh, $5 billion there. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? So that was only for parcel one of Kabul New City, but then uh, phase one, phase one as a whole includes four other developers, um, and that's about 80,000 housing units uh, with total um, uh, direct economic impact in excess of $42 billion over the next 10 to 15 years, uh, and indirect impact of $420 billion. So um, I have no control over how other developers in Kabul New City uh, are going to behave. 
uh, and, and what kind of approach they take. We will work only with um, or mostly with Afghan companies and contractors to um, do our design. So where you come in is uh, to look at those opportunities, those actual physical opportunities that this project will provide through us and to establish contact with us to let us know how you can help and then to prepare yourself for some time next year when the work will start. We expect that uh, the primary infrastructure work will start probably in spring, um, initiated by UNOPS uh, under JICA uh, funding. And then hopefully we will be able to start our uh, vertical construction as well as secondary and tertiary infrastructure work uh, sometime in late spring next year and uh, early summer. Um, I thank you very much uh, for your attention. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to uh, address them. Thank you, Mr. Ludin, and um, I'm sorry we didn't we don't have uh, the time to to give you so for to can talk more a lot about this important project, and uh, but we have one on one this afternoon, you know, and and you can all you're all welcome to talk to Mr. Ludin and uh, uh, later. Um, the next participant is uh, Mr. Taylor. He's Chief Engineering and Technical Services for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And um, as you all know, um, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is probably uh, the most important uh, uh, funder, if I, I can't say funder, but the most important cog within the construction industry in Afghanistan. They are probably the single most single variable in where the construction company, uh, industry in Afghanistan is all about. Mr. Taylor, welcome. Good morning. Um, I'm Greg Taylor. I am the Chief of Engineering and Technical Services with the Transatlantic Division. That's the higher headquarters for our district that's executing work in Afghanistan. Uh, I understand that we're, we're a little bit over time. Fortunately, I don't have any slides, but I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of sort of the, uh, uh, the way we see things kind of playing out for the uh, construction industry in Afghanistan. Uh, as mentioned, uh, you know, we don't actually fund projects. The Corps of Engineers is an execution agent. We receive funds from various stakeholders and customers, and we actually execute the contracts and oversee the construction. So our control is, is although it's, it's significant, um, some of the initial um, ideas and concepts of what we're going to build and where, uh, we don't always get a big play in. But, uh, you know, historically, the Corps of Engineers has executed, you know, a bundle of programs within Afghanistan, military construction, counter-narcotics, uh, security force contracts for uh, the Afghan National Security Forces, Afghan infrastructure projects. Uh, what we're seeing right now is, is the days of having 650 active construction projects uh, may be over for us. Uh, right now, we actually have fewer than 100 projects that are active and ongoing within Afghanistan. We expect the vast majority of those uh, to be completed by the end of this year. Uh, by this year, I mean uh, FY15. Uh, very few projects we expect to actually go on past the 2015-2016 uh, time frame, and what we're seeing is the vast majority of those are infrastructure projects, uh, NEPS and SEPS projects, some bridge projects, some roads projects. Uh, we currently have about seven or eight right now that we're working through uh, the FedBizOps uh, advertising uh, mechanism to allow folks to uh, uh, put in proposals and bids on these contracts, and some of these are, are in the range of 10 to $100 million. Uh, the biggest issue we're having with awarding some of these infrastructure projects, particularly the roads and the uh, uh, transmission of, of power projects is security. Uh, sometimes the security costs, I think uh, uh, we've seen it mentioned here a few times, is, uh, is significant. And some projects will see bids where uh, the cost for security is as much as actually constructing the project. Uh, so it makes it very difficult for us to go back to the funding organizations or agencies or uh, foreign nations and you know, justify you know, spending all these costs for a project where we're getting about half of what we're spending the money on. Uh, but anyways, uh, I'll be here this afternoon to go through the one-on-ones with you guys. Uh, if you have any questions on specifics of uh, what we're actually planning to execute and where, uh, I'll be here to answer those questions. But, uh, um, you know, I'll leave you guys with, uh, you know, with the, uh, I think what's been echoed in here, um, you know, all of this morning is that we're seeing a declining workload. And uh, there are some, uh, some projects coming on the horizon. Some will be significant and big. And the Corps of Engineers will maintain a presence in Afghanistan through uh, 2015 into 2016. Uh, after that, much of that will depend upon the, uh, the volume of the workload with, uh, uh, with new projects and new contracts. So I appreciate you all's time, and uh, thanks. <laughs>